Greetings, welcome to Recovery TV Live. Uh, we have a really special show for you today where we're going to uh, discuss grow the growing concern of technology in our culture and uh, um, is tech something to get excited about or is it the devil? <laughs> and uh, we want you to stay with us because uh, we're going to find out here in just a minute. Welcome to Recovery TV Live. I'm Josh Nichols. This is my co-host, Carrie Kiger. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, something that's on the hearts of many of us here, uh, which is this growing concern surrounding technology in our culture. And we have a really special guest that we're going to uh, introduce right now. And so, um, and so a lot of you have probably heard of uh, Rob Weiss. If you've mm -hmm. heard his name before, it's likely you have seen him on media outlets such as MSNBC or the Oprah Winfrey Network. <laughs> And he writes regularly for Psychology Today, and uh, he's written for the Huffington Post. Um, so many great works that uh, he has done. Um, he's also a published author of many books. Uh, his latest book is called Pro Dependence, Moving Beyond Codependency. So I really encourage you to check that out. And he's also the co-host of a new podcast mm -hmm. called Sex, Love, and Addiction 101. And I've listened to that too. It's fantastic. Um, and he also manages two websites, yeah. so I don't know how he does what he does. Uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Rob Weiss to our show. Well, good morning, guys. Good morning. And uh, by the way, you can call me Dr. Rob. I'll take that. Oh, did you, are you, I knew that you were working that direction, so are you, it's done. This week. Wow, yeah. congratulations. So very, very cool. Yeah. So how do you uh, manage to do all these things that you do? I mean, I think passion, you know, passion is what it's about. Um, I, I know that I have a great commitment to trying to help people heal. And I also have a really big commitment to people understanding what's really happening with tech or with um, online issues and not necessarily their fears. And so, you know, I, I'm really glad you invited me because I try very hard to not say, oh my God, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, but mm -hmm. really speak to where there might actually be concerns that people should pay attention to but not, you know, worrying about everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on the show, too, because we cite your work often in our presentations or to our clients, and we have noticed, especially with certain age groups, that they tend to have an assumption about technology being scary or mm -hmm. negative. And so we mm -hmm. really kind of wanted you to speak to that. So there's a lot of things going on. First of all, we're living in a generation gap, and, and I cannot state that more clearly. Every day it gets more difficult for the two generations to understand each other. You know, I, I live in a world where, you know, most of my experiences were one to one when I was growing up. You know, it was you and me talking going down the street. If you turned away from me, that was rude. You know, now it's not at all rude or, or a part of a young person's culture that you have to get 100% of someone's attention. So older people kind of go, oh my God, those young people are so rude. And, and young people say, that, why do they need our attention all the time? And so, you know, those kinds of very simple cultural differences, not that far apart than the cultural differences in the 1960s where we had people marching in the streets and tie-dye and hating their parents. You know, we are seeing a very mm -hmm. profound divide in generations around tech. Mm -hmm. And that divide creates fear and it creates misunderstandings. Right. And the question I have, and um, there's a book that you've written, this book right here, that you co-authored with uh, Jennifer Schneider, Dr. Schneider. And uh, I found this book fascinating. Um, I've recommended it to a lot of people. Uh, so this book is called Closer Together, Further Apart. And I sat down and I wanted to write a really, I wanted to follow all my you know, 50 year old peers who are therapists and write some terrible book about how tech is ruining our kids and how it's you know the bane of every parent's existence and it's gonna make life on the planet unbearable. And, and then I started reading the research and I still read the research very regularly. And I just don't see, I don't see a source for alarm. You know, I'm so, I understand that certain people will struggle and we should talk about who might struggle online and how they might struggle online and what families can do. But I think your average, you know, when I go out in the world, people are still having babies. They're still working. They're still going on vacations that, you know, life is going on and I see them doing this and I see them talking to their kids. And then I see their kids growing up and um, most of the world is doing just fine. And then there are those who are going to struggle. And right. I do think the struggle is worth talking about. And so, you know, we have a culture that is pushing out a lot of fear-based information about tech related to young people. I just don't think it's all true. 
Right. And right. Te- technology seems to be really challenging cultural norms. Should we not be concerned at all? Or um, Well, I'm not saying that. I just wanted to produce a, a counterpoint because, of course, you need to be concerned. Um, when I go to conferences and they worry, when we talk about concerns among young people in tech, what I experience is not a lot of conversation in the in the really uh, where people are really making decisions about children's health and families' health. We don't talk a lot about healthy kids because we know that healthy kids are going to be fine. Healthy kids have always been fine. We worry about the vulnerable kid, the broken kid, the kid who isn't getting along in school, the kid who maybe gets beaten up all the time, the kid who who has family problems. That's the kid who's going to struggle with tech, just like that's the kid who's going to struggle with drugs or alcohol. Or, you know, I would like to us to think about digi tech. You know, if you want to think about it as a, as a pleasure, then think about it like alcohol. You know, most people enjoy alcohol. Most adults, it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. For some people, it is. For some people, it's not. Mm-hmm. I don't think that we can universally say that tech is bad, or it's ruining our families. Um, I do think we need to look at where the vulnerable people are and where the challenges are going to show up. Mm-hmm. Here's an example. You know, I, I, when a bunch of my peers, you know, hang out with a bunch of young people and they say they're all rude and disconnected and they don't, um, they don't um, care about the people they're with because they're all up into their devices and stuff. I just consider that as noise. You know, that reminds me of my parents saying to me, you know, if you watch too much TV, you know, the, the gray matter is going to run out of your ears and you got to go play outside. And so that kind of message of get away from this device, um, which as a parent, by the way, we paid for it Christmas and then we supply the money for you to keep going at allowance time. You know, like my parents hated the music I listened to, but they bought me the record player and they gave me allowance for the record. So, you know, this is not news that parents are doing this. Um, but worry about the kid who's not involved on a team. You know, worry about the kid who's not um, not in the choir, not attending activities after school, not participating mm-hmm. in life. You know, it's like with addiction. You know, I don't worry about everybody who drinks. I don't even worry about everyone who gets drunk. But I worry about the person who's dropping out of school, not doing well on their job, you know, those yes. kinds of things. And so mm-hmm. what I would ask you to look for if you're worried about someone's involvement with tech is the rest of their life. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, they're gaming three nights a week, three hours a week, but are they still doing okay in school? Do they still have friends? Um, mm-hmm. Are they still dating? You know, those kinds of things are clues to how somebody's doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, part, part of the, the struggle is what you and Dr. Schneider identify as the difference between a digital native and a digital immigrant. So could you explain that concept just a little bit for everybody, the difference between a digital native and a digital immigrant, so everybody knows what we're talking sure. about? Sure, well, I mean, you can all see the gray hair on my face. I didn't grow up with computers. You know, my mom said I didn't even know how to, how, I, I, honest, my mom said, you don't need to take a typing lesson because you're not going to need to know how to type. You're going to have a secretary. You know, the, the idea, that, so... I am clearly a digital immigrant. You know, I didn't come into a world that was all of these devices. I had to learn. And I've, you know, we're doing this because you and I have taken the time to learn the kinds of technologies that are of the present. But not everybody chooses to do that. And so, you know, we have a generation of people who, um, so digital natives, let me say that, are people who are born into the internet. You know, they are born, my nephew, who's four years old, is doing this and doing that. And, you know, he's a digital native. 14 year olds who started with um, Pokemon Go by the time they were six, you know, they, you might consider those digital natives. So there's a big difference between those of us who had to onboard and learn this language and this world of uh, the internet and social media versus those of us who were born into it. For me, like you're right, like I have had to educate myself, but I still think my kids understand technology and experience it very differently than, mm-hmm. than I do. Right. Oh, I was I was at dinner uh, last night with some friends who were in their 50s and two 25-year-olds, you know, and we brought them along. And, you know, they're talking about Magnan, Mongdan, Wangdan, Middan, all of these platforms. And then they're just like chattering away about graphics software. You know, this is not what I talked about with my friends when I was hanging out for dinner, you know, but but this is their world, you know. And, and, and you guys, you know what I want to say? I think this is the most important thing I have to say to anyone who's listening is that I have taught for audiences of thousands of adults who are mostly over the age of 40 because I teach professionals and therapists. Once in a while, I have someone in the audience who's 35 or 30. And I often do trainings about, let's not get down on kids for their tech involvement. Let's look at what it means to them and understand what it is for that child or that family rather than what we think it is for everybody because that's not a good idea. And I tend to be, as you said, in Closer Together Further Apart a fairly 
positive advocate for understanding what tech means rather than globally jumping on it and saying it's bad. Mm -hmm. But when I speak to these thousands of people, inevitably, and I've had this happen a number of times, and I really want you to think about this, where a 30-year-old or a 28-year-old or a 32-year-old in that audience will raise their hand and say, it's sort of around the end of my talk, sort of around then, and they'll say, you know, doctor, I have never heard an, a professional adult stand on a stage and say good things about technology. Mm -hmm. I'm 30, I'm 35, yes. I'm 28, I'm 34. And this is the defining issue of my generation. Mm -hmm. And no older person has anything positive to say. And so to me, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. Um, to me, that speaks of generational prejudice, which is what we experienced with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. When I was a yes. kid, right. it was all that's bad. It was all going to hurt us. you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's kind of what I'm feeling with tech. The word shaming, you know, yeah. my parents said, "Put turn that music down, get out of that room, go outside and play. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Put that device down, go out. You know, I think what is going on with parents is not that different, but it's their issue, not necessarily the kid's issue. Yeah. You know, if you go and play a game with your kid and you start gaming with them, they are much more likely to go outside and play with you. Mm -hmm. If you stand in the doorway and say, put that thing down and stop gaming with your friends, they're much less likely to want to go outside because you're not interested in what's interesting to them. Mm -hmm. So before we universally condemn it, I think it's important for us to say, let me game with you. Let me see, you know, understand what they're doing, not just say, oh my God, they're at it again, kind of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, yeah. right, sure. So let, let's talk about kind of that, that influence. You said what we know is that these 21st century fears have evolved out of 20th century beliefs and experiences that often don't accurately reflect the realities of the world our children are currently facing. Mm -hmm. They laugh at us. I mean, no offense, but kids laugh at us. They're like, oh my God, they're worried about that. Like, <laughs> you know, just like we, I have to say, you know, just like I would listen to some death, death, you know, metal album. My parents say, that will be the ruin of you. I'm like, this is going to be the ruin of me, this yeah. album right here, you know. Sure. Um, I, I, I do want to really say, I, I do understand the concerns about the kids are doing things you have no idea what they're doing, where they're going, who they're interacting with. Of course, this is scary. I'm not wanting to invalidate the fear. I'm just saying it's something to investigate mm -hmm. rather than making an assumption about. You know, you, you in the beginning of that book, there is a quote which I would ask you to read. I Actually, I'll read it for you. I think I know this quote. Um, mm -hmm. There's a guy named Douglas Adams who wrote a, uh, a crazy sci-fi book called um, uh, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy back in the 1970s. And he was kind of a hippie sci-fi guy. And, uh, but he wrote this in 1970, but you know, when, when what we were doing couldn't even have been dreamed about. I mean, this was pure science fiction, this kind of conversation going out into the world like we're doing it. And yet this is what he wrote. He said, all technologies that are new, that are part of the world when you come into the world and you're, you know, let's say up to 18, well, those technologies are just normal and a part of the way things are. You grew up with them. And then he said, all technologies between ages 18 and 45 that are new and exciting and come along, well, that, that could be a, a new career for you. You could make a lot of money. That could be really cool. But unfortunately, all technologies that come along after your age 45 are against the natural order of things in life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think anything's changed. You know, <laughs> if you're about 43 to 32, it's like, oh my God, this new social media thing, I'm gonna get an app, I'm gonna get this. If you're 54, it's like, oh my God, what are they doing in their phones? You know, <laughs> it's just, the line is very clear to me. And I don't want to dismiss the addiction problems, sure. the emotional challenges, the isolation. I do want to say a couple of things about that, though, the problems that people are worried about. One is that um, I believe that the tech is going to resolve the problem of isolation itself. Meaning that right now tech feels more isolating because a two dimensional image or talking to someone on your phone or text, it just, it, it doesn't bring the same level of connection and mm -hmm. people who are doing as real life, that's true. Mm -hmm. And how could it? And so there are people who are suffering from feelings of isolation and not being a part of social connection and not being related in meaningful ways. And they are struggling with depression and anxiety and all those issues. But you see, I know what's coming and what's coming is virtual reality. And when yes. I put that headset on, that VR headset, and I'm looking at my friend across the world, I'm not across the world, we're in the same room. Yeah. 
And it feels to me when my three friends go out gaming in a virtual reality platform, we feel like we're together. We can see each other. We can, you know, pat each other on the arm. I mean, these are such realistic experiences that they're, it's very, very difficult to tell that you're actually not in it. Mm -hmm. So the problem of everybody's talking on their devices and seems so isolated, I think in many ways, virtual reality, the tech itself will solve over time. We're still in an early stage of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that's one piece. Um, um, I also think there's going to be a lot of more tools for people like us to be able to help people, you know, as tech advances. Right now, I can't do therapy for anybody who doesn't live in California because my license is in California. Yeah, right, right. Our boards and organizations have not caught up to the realities of technology. You know, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned sex and relationship healing. That's a site that I have online for intimacy and uh, uh, intimacy problems and couples problems. And I, I know some pretty famous therapists. I know some amazing therapists. You know, you guys know that I could probably pick a great therapist, like an amazing therapist, the expert in certain areas of addiction or sex or whatever, and I could say, be on my site and let's help millions of people for free. Right. And I can't bring those people on my site because we can't help people long distance because we are licenses. So there are issues around our being able to help folks right. that have mm -hmm. not been resolved, that need to be resolved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and part of the reason for that, by the way, is because all the folks who are on our boards and organizations are in their 50s and they don't necessarily, or older, and they don't necessarily understand right. that mm -hmm. this new thing has come along that they need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. This is something that we talk about all the time. Josh and I about how do we help people and feeling really limited by the lack of action. But we're finding in our clients that they're coming to us and saying, what else can I do? Where else can I learn? And especially the people that are under 30, they're already accessing the information that's out there for free. They don't, um, and I really appreciate your saying that because, you know, I do feel the difference less and less, but certainly feel the difference between connecting to someone like this or like this and in person. But honestly, if you're 27, You've been connecting with people like this as a primary connection your whole life. So it doesn't feel that different to you to do this as it does to talk to a person, not like it does to a digital immigrant. Right. Digital natives, this feels native. Yeah. So um, yes, we have a generation of people who are going to be perfectly happy to come online and do therapy with us. Mm -hmm. And But unfortunately, we're not fully able to do that. And yeah. so by the way, like you guys, you know, I'm setting up educational sites so that at least people can get the information and learn yeah. even if we can't provide more to them yet. But, and I want to I want to move into um, in just a minute to talk about um, addiction and recovery but real quickly um, there's also some one, one more thing from closer together further apart that um, I really liked uh, that you said um, you said to watch a toddler actively engage in digital technology is to watch human evolution in real time. You know, I, and what I would say to parents, and I think this is really important to think about is, you know, fire is a technology. The wheel was a technology. In 1962, the pill, which produced the women's movement and the sexual revolution, was a technology. Mm -hmm. It's just because we're looking into these blank boxes doesn't mean these, this is the first form of new technology that humanity has had to you know, my parents, had, my grandparents had adapted to radio, television, cars. You know, there were a lot of technologies and a lot of really terrible things were said, like when the telephone. So I researched this for Closer Together. When the telephone came out, people said that no one was going to go to church anymore because the reason that people went to church was to connect with family and friends and in part. And since they were going to be able to connect with family and friends on the phone, they probably wouldn't go to church anymore because there would be no need to see people there on Sunday. You know, that was the kind, every technology produces its, the fears. Mm -hmm. And every technology produces people who are negatively affected by it. Right. You know, there are people who struggled and died because of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, all of which, by the way, were technologically, technologically right. driven. Those drugs, that music, that sound, yeah. all of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that there are fears, and I understand that this is a huge technological change. And so here is the bad news for older people. Okay, and but this is the real, it's the good news, but it's the bad news. We need to get involved. You know, if we are online and we're over 45 and we are going online for 20th century experiences, you know, if I go online to watch TV, do my banking, chat with a friend, send an email, um, make a vacation plan, buy something on Amazon, that is not doing anything differently than I did in the 20th century. I just do it all with this device instead of all these other ways of doing it or going out in the world. But young people are spending their 
hours in community, in communication, in relationships, doing things online that most other people don't know anything about because we're not spending our time doing that. We're just going in to have our 20th century experience, get that movie, and then go back to real life. Well, for younger people, real life is here. Mm -hmm. And so if us older people don't spend the time to learn LinkedIn, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, hire a college student, any college student, and sit with them for a couple hours a weekend and learn what the meaning of these environments is to them. Because if you can understand what it means to them, then you get to stay young, is what I think. You're right. Yeah, sure. They're changing our rules. We don't like it sometimes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and ultimately, I want to say, I'll say one more thing that's empathic and nurturing toward older people. And you're much younger than me, but you get this. You know, there's a lot of fear there. You know, when I wrote that book, which was, like you said, four years ago, I had to think about, well, do we just turn into nasty old trolls when we get old? And, you know, why are we so mean to... And I don't think it's that at all. I think it's fearful. It's like, you know, what if these young people are going to get ahead of us? What if these young people are going to be doing things that we don't know anything about? And ultimately, who's going to take care of us, attend to us, take care of us when these young people have entered this new world that we don't fully understand? Yeah. And these are always the fears of older adults when, when massive new technological changes occur that we are going to let, get left behind. Mm -hmm. And what we do with that is we judge it and we whine about it and we point fingers at it because that is our fear you know but i and i understand the fear um but that's not a reason to grow and not a reason to not learn and not a reason to not join what young people are doing and by the way this is in the 1970s young people aren't saying oh well we don't trust anybody over 30. they would love to see us get more involved in their digital world yeah. right. we're just not listening right you're right mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. So let's uh, do a segue real quickly into another book that you and Dr. Uh, Schneider wrote. So the name of the book is Always Turned On. Yep. Um, what is it called? Sex, Love, and Addiction in the Digital Age or something like that? Yes. To kind of, first of all, to kind of, kind of keep with our fear, parenting fear thing going, um, <laughs> in this book uh, you said that in reality most uh, young people are able to experiment with porn, video chat, friend finder apps, and other sexnologies, I like that word, without becoming compulsive. And so mm -hmm. what I wanted kind of to get at here is that a lot of parents are afraid, they're calling us, yes. afraid that they found one time that they found porn on their kid's phone, or they were experimenting, and they're like, oh my gosh, my kid becoming a, a sex addict, you know, and what we try to explain to them, similar, I think what you're getting at in the book, is that, that First of all, they're, they're kids and they're experimenting, but they're experimenting with the stuff of their generation. Whereas when I was a kid, it might have been a Playboy magazine, but for them, it's their phones. And it does not mean that because they looked at it, right, that, that they're going to become a sex right. addict. Did you? Right. No, I, I mean, I think, I mean, parents have a lot of dilemmas with the Internet and kids, right? I mean, let's, so we talk about, let's talk about sex just first. There's actually a good thing that is, I'm not sure all parents would understand this or agree with it, but... You know, I, I would ask you guys to just think to uh, think to yourselves. I'm not going to say out loud how you learned about sex, and I'll ask anybody who is over 40 listening to this: <laughs> How did you learn about sex? Because young people have an encyclopedic opportunity to learn anything about human sexuality they want. And I'm not talking about pornography. I'm just talking about gaining information. They can look up homosexuality. They can look at bisexuality. They can look at fetish. They can look and learn about as 15, 16, 17 year old young adults. They can learn about these things. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an advantage that children have in my belief system, because I think knowledge is powerful. And, you know, we only provide sex education in 20 of our 50 states. And 12 of the 20 only allow uh, sex education if the parents give permission. So the reality is that most of the children in America don't get any sex education unless their parents provide it or unless they give permission in the few states that it's allowed. But our kids are getting educated about sex lots and lots and lots by the pornography industry and I um, turn my, my stubby little finger around and I point it right back at parents because um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I, I love that they're calling you. Love that because I would much rather a parent call you when they find their porn on their kid's computer or, and they will other than, rather than going after their kid. Because the first thing that a parent needs to do when they find porn on a kid's computer or device is nothing. Give yourself 24 hours to just breathe, not react. This is your children's sexuality and their intimacy. 
and relationship future. Mm -hmm. This is not that they're up late reading at night and they got to put that book down. <laughs> when you, the words you use to talk to them about the, their pornography involvement is going to affect them the rest of their lives. They're never going to forget it. Yes. Right. So it's really important how you talk to them about it. I'm more worried about um, how it's being perceived and how it's being dealt with or not than, than how many kids are being, whose lives are ruined by porn. I don't want my nine-year-old finding porn. I don't want my, my 11 year old finding or getting into porn. I don't want my 14 year old, you know, if you decide that you want your kid who's a junior or senior in high school, you know, 16 or 17 or 18, that's up to you. But kids under age, they, you have to understand fetishes, like permanent influences to how we view sexuality are determined up to about age 11. So a child is looking at a lot of imagery that they don't understand, it doesn't make sense to them, it's very arousing to them, may end up with some kind of imprint on their sexuality about what they're gonna be turned on by, by when they're 30. That's not gonna happen if they're 16, it is gonna happen if they're 11. And so I have great fear and concern that, you know, there are parents who are figuring out their kids who are looking at porn, but they haven't figured out to the kids 16. The kid's been looking since they were 10. Mm -hmm. right. And that child can be, that can be very, very detrimental. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Real quickly, um, let's talk a little bit just about uh, how this relates. Technology relates to recovery. We do a lot of uh, recovery for sex addicts, and we know that uh, technology is heavily involved in that. And they have to start putting certain parameters mm -hmm. around it. But the, the addict has a hard time distinguishing what, like, what's appropriate for me with tech. I don't believe people are addicted to technology. And I think words matter. So I want to just clarify that. You know, people say there's cell phone addiction. Uh, I don't get it. It's like a cell phone is a, 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 a piece of metal and plastic with all these probably devices, you know, metals in there that would kill me if I ate them. But there's nothing particularly addictive about this piece of black plastic, you know. Now, when I turn it on, it can deliver things to me that have the potential to be addictive, like gaming and gambling and porn okay. and, you know, and okay. spending. Those things are addictive. But this phone itself is not any more addictive than a, than a brown or green glass bottle is for an alcoholic. It's what's inside the bottle that's addictive, mm. not the bottle. Mm -hmm. So I worry when people talk about cell phone addiction, because in part, you know, what you see in young people is not addiction, it's they're enjoying themselves. Like this is their social outlet. If you take this device away from a young person, they are going to look addicted. They're going to be walk around looking lost and they're going to be saying, I'm jonesing for my phone and it's been three days and where's my phone? Maybe that's because they miss their friends. They miss their activities. They miss their family. They miss that instant connection they have with information everywhere around them about what I'm going to do later and what I'm going to do this morning. And, you know, there's some there's meaning in this. And I think for therapists, by the way, to understand that this phone thing, it's not about content. It's not about are young people saying, Mary got 12 cents off at, off on, for, for butter at Safeway and you can get that. It's not about that. It's about that instant sense of connection all the time. Mm -hmm. And if kids are addicted to connection, I'm all over that. Yeah. Um, but there are some people who become addicted to the content and you know, what's the difference between an addiction and a fascination? Well, an addiction is gonna bring down your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can remember times when I found a particular video game cool and I would disappear into my office for a month and you would think I was an addict. But by the end of the month, I was kind of done with the game. It was kind of boring. I wanted to get back to my friends in life. That's not addiction. That's a passing fascination. Mm -hmm. But I work with people, we work with people who get involved with porn and they just stop their friendships. They don't, they start hooking up with cam girls and they can't get a relationship going. They start, um, you know, um, using uh, hookup apps and then they're no longer interested in dating or growing relationships or they're using them while they're married and extensively. And so... You know, it always, there are things that people do that we don't like. You know, they have affairs, maybe they look at porn, we don't like that, whatever. Not my job to say right or wrong, good or bad. We're not here, I'm not here to be a moralist. I'm not here for religious reasons. There are other people who can do that. I'm a therapist. My job is to see, is your life functioning? And if you tell me my life is not functioning because, you know, I think all this porn I'm looking is keeping me from making friends or dating or growing relationships or my wife just left with the kids because she's tired of all the affairs I'm having with my hookups. Then I'm going to say, well, I don't know if porn's a problem or hookup apps are a problem, but you have a problem. <laughs> um, you have a problem and your problem has gotten you caught up in all of these things. 
whereas other people seem able to put them, pick them up and put them down. Let me try it another way. I'm not happy with a guy who went out and hooked up with someone who's married, but I'm not necessarily worried about him being an addict. I am worried about the guy or gal who's hooking up three days a week and with three different people and their spouse knows nothing about it. And you know, when the degree of the behavior, the amount of the behavior and the type of behavior is leading to the disruption or the destruction of your life, the one that you wanna have, school or work or, or love, that's when we talk about addiction. Um, not when I don't like what you're doing or I don't feel comfortable, when I can see that it's profoundly affecting your life. All the things that you said is fascinating. I know you yeah. can probably talk for hours talk for about hours. this stuff. Yeah. Um, there's uh, something that we do uh, on this that has nothing related to anything we just talked about. <laughs> uh, it's just the fast five round. All right, Throw I'll them start at with me. the first one. I'm ready. Name someone interesting to you, dead or alive, that you'd like to have dinner with. Name someone interesting, uh, dead or alive, uh, Brene Brown. Oh. I really want to sit down with Dr. Brene Brown and have dinner. I think that there are things that we have a lot to talk about with each other. Um, that would be someone that I would really like to talk to. And Brene Brown, for those of you who don't know, is a, a really wonderful therapist, and she has some great TED Talks and wonderful books about shame and relationships. And I think she's help change our world in a really good way. Yes. Yes. We uh, agree. We agree. I just listened. I've been listening to her on a Dak Shepard's podcast. I don't know if you listen to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I just released her. It is as fast. She's I just great. finished I it today, her. too. Maybe I'll stump you here on this one. Uh, what is a word that you think <laughs> is fun to say? <laughs> um, it's not a happy word, though. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not even sure I can pronounce it right. But maybe you guys can help me. It's the, it's the hair plucking thing. Oh, yeah. I like that word. Trichotillomania. Trick, what is that Trichotillomania. Called? Yeah, trichotillomania. Say that again. Trichotillomania. Okay, and explain the word. Uh, I don't know where the origins of the word come from, but it's... <laughs> no, no, just uh, what it means. Just what it means. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, the, the hair pulling. Compulsive hair pulling. Compulsive hair yeah. pulling. Right. Okay, I just uh, think that's a really weird word. That's it's interesting. Just, Our last guest said the same thing. Trichotillomania, whatever it, it does, I don't hear the word hair, I don't hear the word pulling, I don't hear. The, I know. Where do they get that word for hair pulling? I don't get it. Don't anyway, that's a, there's a that's an that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Trichotillomania. Yeah, I like that one. Um, what song is currently stuck in your head? What song is currently stuck in my head? Oh, there's a Seal song. I've been listening to a lot of Seal, which a lot of people don't even remember who he was. And I've been listening to a song on Seal Four called Tinseltown. Because the song is about L.A. and the emptiness that this city that I live in can bring and the false illusions of grandeur that people seek here when, and, and they lose themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I've been listening to Tinseltown by Seal. Great, great. Yeah, yeah. All right, last show you binge watched. Wow. Oh, The Crown. Last show I binge watched was The Crown. And I not only loved it that enough to binge watch, I binge watched it twice. <laughs> I think I wanted to move to 1930s England. It was so cool. Um, anyway, I thought Claire Foy was amazing, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how she does with the the uh, spider, you know, the girl, the girl in the oh yes, the, the, the new movie, dragon movie tattoo, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. All right, and the last one is, um, what's your favorite podcast to listen to? Oh, mine. <laughs> no, I, I'm actually, to be very, very honest, I'm not a podcast listener. I'm not. When I listen to, well, I just want to hear music. Like I, I, I really, really want to lose myself in music when, mm -hmm. when. Words are something that I really enjoy reading. I was a, I was a trauma survivor as a kid, and we all have different ways to survive. There's a lot of violence and abuse in my parents, unfortunately, and um, and so I used to read a lot to to find a place to go that was safe. And so words are really so I would rather read than listen to people, but um, so I don't have favorite podcasts. But give me, I want a second question. <laughs> <laughs> Since that one didn't work out. Okay, what's the question? question? I think the, question. The, the, the I actually put um, I changed that one because. I was like, oh, this would be a good question because he does a podcast. I'd like to know because I'm always, I'm a podcast junkie, so I'm always looking for mm -hmm. the next mm -hmm. podcast to listen to. So the original question was, mm -hmm. um, what's your ideal vacation? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that um, my ideal and vacation is spending time with in community, having fun. Mm -hmm. So if I can be with family and extended friends, if I can be with 15 or 20 people who loosely know each other well and are good people, and we can spend a week or two playing games and sitting by the beach and singing songs. And, and that's what life's about. You know, it's about those kind of connections. And, and that's what I, I don't care if it's on a mountaintop or by the sea, but 
it's <laughs> being with people that I care about that makes life worthwhile. That's yeah. awesome. That's, that's really awesome. That's right. That's you're a doing, good one. You're doing amazing work. Yeah, you are doing amazing work. Very yeah. nice. Well, you guys are honoring that. So you're amazing for honoring me and for doing what you're doing. <laughs> I, I, and let, yeah, I'm let's just get me to Oklahoma so we can do some workshops or some intensives or yeah. some live yeah. stuff on the ground. That yeah, sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but again, uh, thank you so much for being here today. I uh, just want to let everybody know that uh, uh, next week we're having Angie Writings on the show. She's actually going to talk about this idea, is uh, is there such thing as video game addiction? So um, kind of that kind of fits right within our tech discussion. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Hint, there is. Yes, yes. there is. Right. Go ahead. Lots of research about that. We will see everybody yes. back here uh, next week. Thank you. Prodependence is a concept that says, if you are the wife of an alcoholic and you come in my office and you've been enabling and caretaking and rescuing and you're working three jobs and you've gained 30 pounds and you're just miserable because you've done nothing but try to keep this family together and he's out there drinking every day. When you come in my office, I'm gonna celebrate you. I'm never gonna to say to that person that any part of their loving attempt to save the life or keep an attachment to someone they love is a problem. I'm going to say all of that was done with the best of loving intentions, even the parts that didn't work out right. I don't care if you were bringing him home bottles at the end of the day, you were bringing them home so he wasn't out at the bar at night drinking and then driving home getting a DUI. That was a good solution. It didn't solve the problem of his drinking, but it did solve the DUI late at night driving into tree problem. I'm not going to tell that partner that she's enabling, care rescuing, caretaking, and she needs to look at her own stuff. That is just, and so prodependence is an attempt to, to really shift our field. And I'm not talking about sex, I'm talking about drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Shift the field of addiction away from looking at partners as being part of the problem and starting to see partners as part of the solution.